Larry McDonald, founder of the Bear Traps Report. Thanks so much for joining me here today. And I know we're starting late because you had a, a client call just now. You just got off that client call. What what are you talking about with the clients? What exactly when you get off the phone to talk to me, what is that conversation like? What are they worried about? Are they nervous about, hey, you know, we're starting to collapse a little bit at the beginning of the year? Is it gonna look like two years ago where the high was Jan one and we we never came back to that the rest of the year? Or is it you know, dry powder to get back into the markets? Is it a sector, a single name? What What are you jumping off of right now? Well, we have an interesting platform because, you know, I believe in democratizing information. And behind me, we have a Bloomberg chat with about 650 institutional investors in like 20, 23 countries. A big so group chat. They're all in it yeah, together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's like a live conversation where we imagine 650 people in a theater uh, where 20 to 30 people a week or a day get up and have a conversation in front of that 600 to 650 people. So most people in the chat just observe the conversation. But during the day, as you kind of just pointed out, like, like we're seeing a big rotation back into value. So that's one of the conversation points, like the outperformance of say Berkshire versus Microsoft or Apple is like one or two standard deviations greater than we've seen in the last year, or at least, at least you got to go back to 2022 to find that. So there's clearly, and there's a lot of money flowing into coal names, uranium names, uh, hard assets this year versus financial assets. The financial assets had a brilliant fourth quarter. So that's your growth, you know, your, your mag seven, but, What's happened is each time you get up near 20 trillion in the NASDAQ 100, um, it's a real problem spot. And right now you're seeing a pretty incredible flow out of financial assets, so out of the MAG 7, out of big caps, back into uh, hard assets and companies that, that, that actually own assets that can protect you from inflation. I keep hearing about hard assets. I keep hearing about uranium. Like I never heard about uranium as much as in the last couple of months. Is this something that's that's real, or is this just like a a YouTube niche, you know, weird niche world about uranium and hard assets? Or is this actually like institutions now getting real serious about these investments? Well, I mean, a year ago it was a fringe group, but now, so what, what's what's happening? So one of the points in my book is it's coming out this quarter. It's called When Markets Speak. And the foundational point is we've taken 5 million jobs out of the United States the last 20 years, and we've moved them into other parts of the world. We've shotgunned these jobs, like to Bangladesh and to Indonesia, to, to, to obviously to India and China. And so we've created a tremendous amount of wealth globally. And what we're doing is we're creating all these new carbon consumers, because if you're in India or Indonesia right now, and you work in an AT&T call center or whatever, you make probably 10 times to 100 times more than your great-grandparents or your great-great-grandparents. And so what does that person want to do? They want to own a moped. Uh, they want electricity. Right now there's 1 billion people in India that don't have air conditioning. And there's over 150 million people that don't have any, any electricity at all. And so as you raise the standard of living in the developing world, you're creating an explosion of new carbon consumers. And so we have a, a, a billion people more on the planet today, one billion, than we had in 2014. So imagine one billion more people. With just but, population growth or new carbon users? No, that's, that's just population growth. Oh, so it's a billion a, more one, people in 10 years. Yeah, one billion in 10 years from 2014 to now. But the investments in, say, energy infrastructure and uranium exploration in oil and gas, in coal, like the, these investments are, are down. Oil and gas were down about two to three trillion dollars in terms of if you took where we were in 2014 and you extrapolated it forward to today, we have about a three trillion dollar hole. And, and so I think it's very almost certain that in the next two to three years, we're going to have a massive energy crisis because we want to create this green transition. We don't have enough copper, right? We want all these new electric vehicles, but we don't have enough uranium to power the nuclear power plants. You know, we want, 
you know, we want we want a better lifestyle, but in emerging markets, oil and gas and coal are the cheapest commodities, and th those developing parts of the world and won't be able to afford uh, solar and some of the new technologies. So there's, like, we're going to move to carbon neutral 20, but it's not going to be 2050. It's going to be more like 2100. In other words, you know, f far, far out into the future. And you, you, we're going to need to fill that carbon hole. That's that's a huge difference, right? Because if it's 2100, you and me aren't al alive for that, right? 2050, okay, maybe we see it, but what does this all mean for when you're talking to to clients and they're thinking about investments? Because that's so far into the future, right? That what are they supposed to do with that, right? Like if we go back 30 or 50 or 100 years ago, investments that that you thought made sense back then about where we're going to be in the year 2024, like none of that stuff ends up predicting, right? You know, so you can be betting on things from so long and you're either way too early or you're way too wrong. What are they supposed to do with that, right? When we're talking about 2050 and 2100, is that just so far into the future that, that you're just winging it? You're guessing? Like, how, how do they invest off of that? How do they invest That's for, it. I got to beat a benchmark in 2024 and, yeah. and I got to beat it now, right? And I, you know, like I, nobody, nobody cares about decades from now. At least my yeah, that's a, that's a great that's a great pushback, and I commend you for it. And um, I'd say, let, okay, let's talk about 2024. I'm, I'm not pushing back on you. I'm pushing back on like, how do the investors deal with that, right? Like, because you're right, this is all going to happen. These trends are happen, but but we can easily be wrong by a decade, and all of a sudden, the extrapolation effect means you could be totally wrong today trying to get that investment right. Well, what we've seen is the price of uranium is up about almost 100% over the last year. and But the uranium equities are dramatically underperforming. And so relative to the commodity. So what happens with a, with a new emerging trend, uh, a lot of times people move into the commodity first, the safe, it's going to be viewed more safe than say exploration companies. And so that's where the kind of the, the new money will move into. But we think over the next year, there's because of the cheapness of the uranium producers, the uranium infrastructure to support all these nuclear power plants. We know for a fact that the amount of nuclear power plants in China, in Europe, uh, that whole replacement cycle is exploding. So that's right here, right now. But the infrastructure to actually pr produce the uranium needed to supply all these plants is, is desperately uh, needs support. So that's one area. And then for 2024 in particular, you know, we've been lectured at a great length, right, that Putin tried to rig the 2016 election, right? And let's just let's just say we believe that. Let's say we believe Putin tried to rig it. He was buying hundreds of do thousands you, of dollars. Do you believe that? Or are you saying it more like this is just nonsense that's out there? Well, I, I think that he, he definitely has a, he definitely has a vested interest in one side, but you know, I don't think he's the reason why Trump won the election, you know, but 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 let's just say that we think he is vested in, in say, a Trump win. What do you think he's going to do with the strategic petroleum reserve that has been drained by hundreds of millions of barrels over the last year, year and a half? We're at a very dangerous level. Uh, we think that this year Putin's going to take down production and. Uh, especially if there's peace in the Ukraine at some point or some type of detente or some type of resolution, he won't have to sell as much oil. Uh, and so therefore he can, he can take a lot of oil off the market and really juice prices to try to influence the election. You know, that's one thing. And so, so there's a lot of these trades for 24. We're looking at, okay, what, you know, what's likely to happen in an election year? Normally the White House would have Republicans or Democrats would have a huge strategic petroleum reserve. Now we're down a lot. And so these are the types of things, these are the types of trades we're looking at in 2024, whereas, okay, you could have a surprise, you know, geopolitical surprise in energy, which we're already seeing a lot of stress in the Middle East, right, seeing the Red Sea. And so that type of trade for this year, I think more geopolitically driven or more multipolar world. Have you, have you thought about the difference between a multipolar world and a, and a unipolar world? Have I thought about it? Yeah. Yeah, I thought about it, right? Because we're seeing that happen right now, right? We're seeing these different factions, the China, Iran, Russia, 
Venezuela, Cuba, whatever faction, right? That's a faction. And then there's this, you know, US Western Europe faction. And and, and maybe there's another one floating around out there that, that I'm not paying attention to, right? But obviously we know there's at least two. Exactly. And and so you think about the previous decade, right? So everybody's portfolio watching us right now, the entire nation of America, everybody's 401k has been hijacked. It's in the last decade's portfolio. What do you mean hijacked? Wait, what, what do you mean 401ks have been hijacked? Well, we know that we know that 45% of the S&P is in technology. And out of that, Microsoft and Apple alone are close to 14% of the S&P, about 13.5%. Oh, do you mean hijacked the by the weightings moved on? I thought you were going to say they were hijacked by these other countries in a multipolar world. That's what I thought. No, no, no. Like they stole no, it? No, they're, well, they're just hijacked. Well, Microsoft's 7% of the S&P, and the entire energy sector is 4%. And so- Is that have, true? You, so you have, we have more Microsoft than all energy in the S&P? I had no idea. Yeah, more, almost double. So Microsoft is- uh, Microsoft is 7%, just under 7 and the entire energy sector is you know, all the oil and gas companies combined and throw in uranium, and it's like 4% of I the s Yeah, so the, 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 what I mean by hijacked is that everybody's been addicted to this passive investing uh, for because the S&P's outperformed. It's getting more and more and more and more and more crowded into fewer and fewer and fewer names. And this is a tremendous amount of wealth in America is tied up in fewer names. And so we're going we're gonna to see this year and next year a trend, a massive migration out of these crowded trades because this entire trade, Eric, is set up for the previous decade where we had disinflation, right? We had um, a unipolar world. We had less global conflicts. We had labor, labor unions that were powerless. And now we have labor unions that have far more power. And so the probability of a sustained inflation world where we don't go back to one, two, it come, stays into that two, three, four, and with global conflicts, that's going to sh- create, right now there's $20 trillion, Eric, in the NASDAQ 100, $20 trillion. You know, five or six years ago, that number was, even a year ago, it was $12 trillion. Uh, right after, nine, uh, right after say, COVID, it was down to seven, seven and a half, eight trillion. So- we have a tremendous amount of wealth that's in fewer and fewer stocks, and that money's going to migrate out of that concentration into all different types of assets. Where does it go? You think it goes into other stocks? Does it go like out of that NASDAQ 100 altogether as opposed to, let's say in the S&P case, okay, maybe it comes out of Microsoft, but then does it just stay within the S&P 500 because you're putting it into energy, right? So maybe that 7-4 ratio starts to equalize, but if you own the index... You still have it? Or you think it's just coming out of the index altogether? And is it going into stocks if it's out of the index, or is it going into these, like you said, hard assets, things that are not not part of the stock market at all? Well, let's think about it. Last time we were in a real multipolar, elevated inflation world, global conflicts, say 1980, 50% of the S&P 5-0 was in industrials, like 49%. So if you look at the composition of the S&P, it was 49% industrials, metals, mining, and oil and gas. And so right now, uh, we know oil and gas is down at four. We know materials is like, like three and a half, called, that's seven. And we know that industrials may be another eight. So we're basically right now, that those groups like, that were 49% of the S&P, the last time we were in a multipolar world with more sustained inflation and power of labor and everything like that. We were 49% for those groups. Those groups, we're not going back to 49, but we're probably going back to 30, 32. So that means that energy is a percentage of the S&P composition is going to go say from four to maybe eight or nine. Um, metals and mining, uranium, uh, coal, they're going to go from say three, four percent of the S&P to eight. And industrials, global value stocks, they're going to be a much bigger part of the equation as well. That's where the money is going to go. And also the money's going to go to emerging markets. So are you, how are you invested then? You know, like let's say here we are beginning of January. Are you, 
Are you shorting the S&P? Are you underweighting a NASDAQ? Are you buying emerging markets? If you had to say to somebody, here's your one-year portfolio, just you know, get you to December 31st, what, what's the structure for them? For your, your typical, you know, let's call it your 401k investor, right? How do you do well this year? Okay, yeah. So if it's a 401k investor, it's keep it simple. Um, right now you want to, you know, raise some cash overall because the market's gone up quite a bit the last three months. You want to have a greater composition in industrials, um, materials, so the XME, uh, which is your materials, your mining, um, the XLE, the OIH, these are oil and gas companies, and or, or sorry, oil and gas ETFs. Right. And then the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is the D, I think it's the D, uh, DIA. So those are ETFs that own industrials, metals and mining, oil and gas which, like I said, were 49% of the S&P in 1980, and now they're close to 13% of the S&P. We, they, they probably double. That those, those three sectors probably go from 13 to, say, 26% of the S&P over the next two, three, four years. What are you staying the hell away from then? Is it all this tech stuff, Magnificent Seven, all those goodies? Yeah, we're, you know, we, we've, been, we've been bearish on the Magnificent Seven. And, and listen, we were wrong last year. We were very right the year before. These stocks are unchanged. Let me tell you something. Amazon is unchanged for 30 40 months tesla's unchanged for 36 months gone nowhere gone nowhere it's gone nowhere but given a lot of people a lot of heart attacks in its process of going nowhere yeah because the you know they go down 50 percent. like jackie gleason used to say the only problem with losing 50 percent is you need 100 percent to get it back yeah. right so what happens is they go down by 50 the media under reports that because no for a lot of different reasons they don't want to kick people in their down and then they go up by 80 percent and everybody's like, oh, my God, tech is it, it's we're really just washing around. The, it, it, right now, the NASDAQ 100, the NASDAQ composite is unchanged for more than two. NASDAQ composite unchanged for more than two years. Right, right. And so th there already is this transition going on. It's just it's just been slowed down by AI. That's for sure. Well, you know, the name of your company, the Bear Traps Report, did do... You know, what, what do you get from that feedback? Why do people think, okay, is this guy always a bear then? Or is he, is he, because the bear in a trap is dead, right? So are you looking, <laughs> out, are, you, are, are you a bull trying to kill the bear? Are you the bear trying to avoid the trap? Like what's, what's your general perspective on, well, on who you, you are know, and how you came up with the name? Our, our, our book. So I was a trader at Lehman Brothers and we produced a book called The Colossal Failure of Common Sense. And it became a New York Times bestseller. Um, it was in, basically printed in 12 different languages. And so we did a lot of speeches around the world and we, we quickly realized, you know, we have a really wonderful group of people that we're meeting. So we wanted to create a product and, you know, the bear trap support, the name itself is just talks about, okay, you want to be careful of a bear trap, number one, but we also want to think about the direction of the market, uh, capitulation, like in the old days, um, but right now, there's a, there's a lot of technical analysts on Twitter, right? And so th there's a lot of people doing the same thing. They're selling uh, on stop losses, and they're, they're, they're getting flushed out of stocks, like, like say, tech in 2000, the, say, a year ago right now. Um, the, the ARC, Tesla, Apple, NVIDIA, these stocks were all in flames, and everybody was kind of getting flushed out of That's kind of like a bear trap. And so... We want to buy capitulation moments, and we want to be there for the turn. We want to catch that next five-year cycle. We don't want to catch a falling knife, but we want to add into capitulation selling and then be there for the turn, and which is the five-year new bull market. That's the objective of the bear trap support. And how do you feel like you've, you've accomplished that objective over the last few years? Do you feel like... You know, what are you doing differently, right? Because there's so many people that we talk to, right? You know them, I know them, they're always around. What is it that you're looking at that's different? Data points, approaches, you know, strategies, methodologies. When you get a client that signs up, when they say, and these are institutional clients, I'm not telling people that are watching right now, that you got you to go buy Larry's product, right? If you want to do that, great. But I'm talking about those institutional clients, they're bombarded with data out there what is it that they appreciate about you? That's what I'm trying to get at. So if someone's watching this, what is it about Larry's approach that is unique and stands out from the rest of the marketplace? Well, you know, take, take uranium, for example, or oil and gas. Whenever you have a sector that's in a bear market, like so oil and gas were in a bear market in 2016, 2020, 
the same thing with uranium. Um, you want to buy into capitulation selling and measure capitulation, like mathematically measure, is this a category one storm? Is this a category three or is it a category five? So we look for, like we, we mathematically and scientifically measure capitulation. We look for that seller exhaustion. We buy into sell-offs. We will lighten the portfolio through the capitulation process and then hold a position for the long run. So what we're trying to do is nobody can pick a bottom, but what we do know is that certain sell-offs are mathematically unsustainable. And sometimes we do get caught in these bear, bear traps, but our goal is to not get caught and to actually accumulate, say, oil and gas or uranium. If you buy into those sectors, like in 2020, 2021, oil and gas had these incredible capitulation sell-offs these, these rallies, these counter-term rallies, and then retest and retest. And then you need to form a real base, that real proof of seller exhaustion, so you can identify the turn mathematically, because you know that everybody has been carted out and there's nobody left to sell. That's what we try to do. We have fancy equations. When you say mathematically, what, what are you looking at for for knowing, okay, everyone's been carted out, the sellers are exhausted. What's, what's in that okay. equation or what, what's, you know... What's an okay. example of okay. an input you're looking at? Say, take the XLE ETF or the URNM, which is the XLE, say, oil and gas, or the URNM, say, uranium, or you take the Cameco, CCJ. You know how many shares are outstanding, right? And you know that if you're in a bear market and you're making new lows, that the audience that's in those stocks owns them at a much higher price. And so... If you measure the, the breadth of the selling, the acceleration of the selling, the speed of the selling, and you can look at, okay, what's the distance below the lower Bollinger Band where you're buying the stock? So that's so the RSI, which is relative strength on a weekly and a daily. The lower Bollinger Band kind of is, is, is on Bloomberg. It, it detects how oversold the sector is. So if you look at these factors and you calculate how much selling took place in a, in a short period of time relative to the shares outstanding. And you can see a new owner base is forming at say $20 versus say two years ago it was at $30 or 40. You can mathematically calculate, okay, the selling is almost over. You don't know for a fact because that's why, that's why you have these counter trend rallies that sometimes fail. But over time you can calculate a pretty good educated guess as to, you know, how much selling has been done and, is this a category three, category four, category five capitulation? So right now, let me give you an example. So we had a category five capitulation in energy and uranium, say 2020 and 21. Uh, the, the, two, the two signals that I'm seeing now looking forward instead of looking back is say, the cannabis space has had a category five absolute washout last year. And now you have the White House making some very aggressive moves with, with uh, Department of Justice that could make some of these companies a lot more profitable. Same thing with China. Um, K-Web, for example. The, you've got a lot of evidence of real seller exhaustion because of the war in the Ukraine with Russia. People are afraid now to own any kind of stock that is associated with Russia or China. And uh, I had dinner a couple weeks ago with a portfolio manager that runs a very famous a fund that owns Chinese equities. And he's like, Larry, you know, two, three years ago, we were in Europe and we had standing room only for breakfast, standing room only for lunch. And now I just got back from a trip and we had four people at lunch and seven people at dinner. Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. Like, you, you, there's all kinds of evidence of seller exhaustion in those two spots. And, and that's what our model's pointing to uh, for 2024 uh, is opportunities in those two spots. What, what have you been surprised about this first week of the year? You know, I'm looking at, you know, an S&P that's kind of at 4,700 range, but those first couple of days, right back, right back from vacation, everyone's like, let me get out a little bit, right? We saw bond yields go from five to, you know, threes in a matter of, of months, right? At the same time that equities had that huge rally on the macro side. And then, you know, these last couple of days, you know, starting to pick back up towards 4.0. So, do do people have this weird thing about I come back to work on January second and and I just start unwinding stuff or I start getting nervous about hitting my benchmarks? What is it about that first week of the year 
right? Like last week, we were going to talk last week and you know, you're, you're not at home. There's a power outage, right? Like you're not in your normal work mode. No one's in their normal work mode. Now you get back to January. People are back to work. They're focused. Kids are back in school, right? They're less distracted. Is there something specially weird about this first week? Are you surprised by some of the moves? And, and, and again, I know this question is too long, but like walk us through the mentality of that first week behavior, right? The calls you're having, the conversations, the group chat you're having, right? Like what is it about this first week in general? And what have you noticed specifically this year about behavior this first week? Well, we, we did a scientific study, meticulous analysis of this. And it, there's a blog up on our website, uh, the Bear Traps Report website. If you Google Bear Traps Report, go to our website. This is the most recent blog discusses this in great detail. But in years where the large market cap stocks have outperformed the broader market by a wider percentage, right? So oh, some years you'll have the, a very narrow percentage between the winners and losers. But in years where there's a very extended spread between the winners and losers, what happens is when you come to year end, people want the winners on their pad, number one, so that if you're a pension fund, a mutual fund, or whatever, you want to show that you've got these great stocks. And the, the, the better they did, the more you want to show them. And the worse the stocks do, the more likely you don't want to have them. And it creates more, it, what, it, what it does is it creates a, a greater acceleration of tax loss selling in the fourth quarter. Uh, and it creates a whole bunch of people that want to hold on to winners. And then if you sell your winners in the first week of January, you don't have to pay the tax until April of 2025. Yeah, like 16 right? months later, yeah. Yes, but, but, the, but the problem is if there's huge gains, huge gains in mar large cap stocks in the fourth quarter, the last thing someone wants to do is sell those in December and pay the tax right away in, in April. Like, so they're going to do whatever they can. And so the create, this creates an incredible op opportunity for tax law. So we put a... We put a trade alert out. Uh, we, we have WhatsApp trade alerts on, say, the XBI, which is the biotechs. We put that out in um, November, November and December because the, the biotechs had underperformed the NASDAQ by the greatest percentage ever in the last 10, at least 10 plus years. And, and so the capitulation selling you, like if you were a pension fund, a mutual fund, any kind of fund, you needed to get out of those biotechs in the fourth quarter and you need to own MAG7, Magnificent 7, the large caps. And now, since you're in a new year, uh, all that seller exhaustion has gone away. Uh, and you're in a new year where, you know, you're, you've got, I think, a very large percentage of the biotech index is trading at cash value. And you've got a very high probability of mergers and acquisitions because there's so many cheap candidates. You're right. The, the tax game it creates a lot of weird distortions, right? It creates behaviors that, I don't know if it's like a game where the rules have these, these skewed rules to them. So we do things that we wouldn't otherwise normally do, right? There shouldn't be any difference between December and January, sort of like November and December, or January and February, but we create these tax rules. And as a result, these behaviors come out that maybe if we were looking at this on a longer term perspective, we wouldn't make these transactions, right? So it's, it's just causing disruptions unnecessarily in a way, but that's just the nature of the game. Yeah, that's the nature of the U.S. tax system and the concentration of wealth. So the baby boomers have about 78 trillion of wealth. Um, the millennials only have like seven or eight trillion of wealth. So and the Gen X has a, a decent amount. But the spread between the boomers at 78 trillion and the oldest boomers now are about 78 years old too so it's a good way to remember it there's about 78 trillion of wealth that are in the boomers um there's about seven or eight trillion of wealth in the millennials and so the tax thing is huge because there's so much wealth in the hands of an aging group uh these are veteran investors they they want to avoid tax and so you have this very habitual crazy behavior at your end but I want to point something out to you. Because the boomers are trading, you know, turning like 78 now, the average boomer is almost 70, and you've got such an attractive yield in bonds, it's going to create a very difficult environment for the major indices over the next year and a half, two years. Because right now you can just go to cash and get 4 or 
where just three years ago, you go to go to cash and get less than one. And so and so that because the boomers are now when Lehman went down, the oldest boomer was 64, 65. Um, when COVID went down, the oldest boomer was, you know, 75 or 76. Now the oldest boomer is 79, 78 years old. And that's a lot of wealth in a very age group. And it's creating a lot, a lot of these year-end distortions. I mean, you hear those numbers, and this is morbid, but like they're all going to die, right? In the next 20 to 30 years, these people are mostly going to be dead. Where does that money go? Is that just a state tax to the government? And hey, boom, $30 trillion in debt is solved because we just took it all from the boomers and they're dead now? Or is it, you know, they put them in trust to give to their poor millennials who have a tenth of their wealth? Or like, where does this money go? Because it's going to go somewhere and it's not going to be with them. They're going to be in the coffin. Well, the, the step up in cost basis is, and I'm not an estate yeah. planner, and, you know, I really respect that group of people because they have some tremendous advantage and uh, alpha generating ideas in that group. But from what I understand, the step up in cost basis is still there. So if you pass assets to your uh, younger, you know, your lo- your loved ones, your children, say you're seven, say you're 80 and you own Microsoft and you pass the, or you own a house, or a million dollar house, $10 million, and you pass that asset along, there's a step up in cost basis. So the, 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 the heir doesn't have to pay the tax on, on all that. The, the, the cost basis goes up. But, you know, if, if Congress goes the wrong way over the next couple, couple of years, that eventually is going to change. And um, they may, there may be much more aggressive tax, you know, losers or t- t- tax deficiency where there's no step up in cost basis and therefore the younger generation gets hit with a lot more taxes. But I think about it from the dynamics, like you said, right? They, they're veteran investors. They, they play this tax loss selling game in December. You know, the gains, you maybe sell those in January. There's a lot of game, the games that they play, but at some point they're not going to be as big participants in the system. It's like their participation will start to decline now. Does that change the nature of how we we play these you know end of December beginning of January type of trades right if they start all right we're moving into treasuries I'll just take my five percent I'm not in stocks more do you think about that at all is that something your clients think about or is it just is that too too murky too vague to worry about for 2024? Well, that gets back to your original point. Like you did, that's a, that's a, a great point, but it's going to take at least another six or seven and eight years for it to really fully play out where the money starts to there's no question the millennials are going to inherit you know know, tens and tens of trillions of dollars right there's no question the millennials are going to inherit this money but it's going to take so much time and and therefore for right now we do know that the aging population is going to definitely change market behavior to some extent you think of passive investing so the reason why the s p is outperformed is you've had concentration of fewer and fewer names. Everybody's doing the same thing. More and more money because it's working. More and more and more and more and more money's gone into passive. And so we've had this one-way freight train. Josh Brown wrote about this in a blog like back in 2014. It was called The Endless Bid. And Josh's point was that the millennials, the, you know, but there was so many, I'm sorry, the, old, the, the aging population who had so much money in passive and the, the passive money was going to keep coming in because they weren't at reti- ret- that much of retirement age yet. They, were, they weren't exiting the market. But that whole thing, that whole thesis is starting to reverse because when the, the, mille- when the, when the boomers reach 78 to 70, then more and more of them are going to change that behavior because you can't be fully invested in stocks when you're that age. So Josh Brown's endless bid thesis around the flow into passive I think, and it's part of our book, our prediction, the next 10 years, that endless bid is going to become the endless offer. And that's what I mean is more and more of those uh, boomers want out or they want to go in a fixed income and you're going to have kind of a, a sideways move in the indices. Yeah. And endless bid, it'll be the other way, right? Like, <laughs> Endless yeah, exactly. Offer, yeah, endless the offer, an endless bid or, is an or, endless buyer. Or no bid, an right? Offer. There is no bid. That'll be a whole other ball game too. So, <laughs> what are you what are you looking for for next week? Obviously, there's some big industry conferences, right? CES, J.P. Morgan Healthcare. There's just a lot of companies talking about stuff. You know, big big announcements, that kind of thing. 
either what are you focused on for next week? What are your clients talking about? You know, this this as we ended this week and getting into next week. Anything, any themes come up? You make a great point. I mean, there's one thing that you know because of my first book, you make about ten times more in the speaking tour than you do. Is that true? Book. And so, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and that's what what I noticed is there's a tremendous amount of conferences in Florida in January, February, and so you, you're going to get you know, a lot of analysts that uh, a lot of CFOs and CEOs that have been a, a, for a quiet period here. You've had the holidays and you're going to get some color from different sectors. Um, you know, I expect companies like Lululemon could be, uh, you know, we're seeing some clients looking around the consumer side because there's an incredible divergence between companies like Lulu and other, you know, Nike and Under Armour. And so we're, we're seeing some, some, some people start to short some of these extended consumer plays. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we have uh, a government shutdown risk. We always have that. That's like every six to 12 weeks now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, but it's really going to heat up because the border wall thing is so significant. That, you know, a million, a million people come across the border. And so Republicans are more motivated than ever. And I think the spending deadlines on the 19th of, of January, and then it's again on February 2nd. And then you have the State of the Union address coming up. So you're going to have a real showdown in Washington around spending. and around. So that's probably going to create some stress. The VIX by itself is just very cheap uh, relative to the market. I mean, the VIX itself, you know, very like volatility relative to geopolitical risk, I think is really, really cheap here. Volatility, yeah, low, cheap volatility relative to geopolitical risk. I, I agree with that. that. That makes sense. So we'll see. So we'll see what happens next week. And then. You know, lastly, Larry, what, what's keeping you up at night, right? Like, what is the, what is the one thing? Maybe nothing's keeping you up at night, but what is, what's the one thing that stresses you out the most these days? Just the, 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 the probability that Israel makes a move on Iran is, is very high. Iran's enriching in a large amount of uranium. They've been doing it for years. They've been, the White House has been kind of, it's very friendly with Iran now, and it's, it's if you're. Israel, and you just got hit with a massive national security event. But the probability that you hit Iran and test the White House's resolve is, I think, really high. And and then um, at the White House, uh, the, the, the situation in the, in the Ukraine is growing very desperate because both sides haven't shown a lot of progress. Putin's made it a very aggressive move the last two weeks in Kiev or Kiev. I don't know, you know, I don't know how you pronounce Kiev. In the old days, we say say Kiev, right, right. Like Kiev. But like I, I think the geopolitical stuff the next couple of weeks uh, is, is is really your probability of some some fireworks is, is very very high into the no, it makes sense right it, it is a conundrum here we are at all time highs and we got a couple of hot spots with some some very dangerous countries so you know that's something we're gonna have to sort out here in 2024 and then before we go Larry so tell us again about the book real fast and everywhere people can find. You. I know you got a lot of Twitter followers. So like, just, just give us a quick summary of where everyone can track you down. Well, it's called When Markets Speak. And um, Neil Ferguson did the forward. David Einhorn's in there. Mark Cuban uh, was very helpful. Uh, we had a number of really talented people, David Tepper, Charlie Munger. So it's called When Markets Speak. It's out the first quarter. It's up on Amazon. It's up in Barnes and Noble. If you just Google When Markets Speak. And on Twitter, we're at Convert Bond, Bear Trap Support. Come in and join us at the Bear Trap Support because what, what we're really doing is democratizing information. We're taking this chat, and I'd be happy to, happy to include you guys, which I think we do from time to time. But we take the institutional conversation, and we recap that for the family office, the financial advisor. and give, We want to give them a lens on a, buy, on a private buy-side conversation and kind of democratize information. That's what we were trying to do in 2024. Beautiful, beautiful. Larry, thank you so much for, for being my guest today. Larry McDonald of the Bear Traps Report. Thank you so much for watching Wealthy on. I'm Eric Chain. Remember, go to WealthyOn.com. If, if you can't get this all sorted out yourself, we've got some investment advisors that we endorse. You can fill out a short form, have a free conversation if that's right for you. And, you know, just it's no commitment, right? Just something we provide as a free public service. If, if you're hearing what Larry says and think, I need to figure this out, you know, WealthyOn.com. You can go there. There's also the the Anthony Scaramucci show. If you've got questions, you can go to the website there too and and check that out. So Larry, thanks again for joining me. I'm Eric Chummy. We'll see you next time.